Uh, let's welcome in John Macroon, uh, the, doc, yeah. the, doc, the doc, the legend, the doc, uh, you know, very, very nice swing. The doc has, he does. Uh, and you could check out Detroit lions on sports illustrated now. I mean, come on, this the revamp, guy, baby, revamp, you know, go check it out. Link is in the description. Please welcome to the show, host of the Detroit sports podcast and the man who runs Detroit lions on sports illustrated, Mr. John Macroon, John, welcome to the program. How you doing? It's a special day. One week. Until the media gets to go out there. Did you guys hear about Aiden Hutchinson? We, uh, just started off, John. What do you Doc, know? What's going on? Doc, Spill nothing, the beans. Spill the nothing beans. burger, right, Doc? Not that people yep, are overreacting. I, yep. I checked in with my source, Barry McCockner, and nothing <laughs> is going on with Aiden Hutchinson. All clear. What was that? Is that you actually Who, have a source? Okay, yeah. What a source. Uh, Booner, <laughs> Booner, please tell me that did not go over. Booner, Booner's no, like, I, I get it, but I thought maybe oh, Booner, I thought maybe I love you guys. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you had uh I thought maybe you had a source, but you were just covering it up with a different name. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, 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 no. Barry McCockner is real, Boone. Very reliable. That's guy. a valid – just like Jeffrey Collum. <laughs> Jeffrey Collum, Barry McCockner, they're, they're valid sources <laughs> under the same network. I think you just got to – sometimes yeah. there could be some fake ones that you got to kind of weed out. Hey, actual hey, Barry well, McCockner he's not as good as Jeffrey Collum, but, you know, no. he's, right. Je- Jeffrey Collum. I see what you guys are doing here. Uh, but, Doc, uh, yeah, the, the whole Hutchins and stuff, I mean, you see Kirby – you know, post the 97 heart, uh, you know, and then he puts the crying face and now people are freaking out. I, I, I would assume it's a, it's a nothing burger at this point. Uh, you can see why the panic's there because of how important he is to this, to this roster. But I'm glad you, you think it's a nothing burger. That makes me feel a little better because media has not said a word about it. I mean, I haven't seen anyone say anything. So maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. Look, to be honest, I love the fan base in Detroit. They check in, like, I don't even have that much time to check all the social media of all the players, but they post messages all the time. So our job is just to kind of, you know, relay the message. And look, if something was posted seven hours ago, you can kind of surmise that if something serious happened, one of the national media or one of the reporters in town, myself or anybody would have found out or uh, been investigating this. And I don't think anything happened to Aiden Hutchinson. Look, I agree, though. Fans should be on top of things. They should be nervous because if something does happen to Aiden Hutchinson, that's a big concern for your defensive line. And everybody right now in Detroit is really happy, excited for the start of training camp because this football team has a legitimate chance to win the Super Bowl. And any injury to a key player is going to be concerning because Aiden Hutchinson is the anchor of that defense. Nothing can happen to him uh, of a serious nature and uh, everything going on is uh, very serious in regards to the Detroit Lions. And I, I respect that. I don't tell people not to panic. I think the worst thing people do is to tell everybody to calm down. You should be passionate. You should be excited. You should be all in. You should be checking out everything because this is a special football team. And football fans, I think it's crazy to tell football fans that are rabid about their favorite team to calm down. I think that, though, um, definitely you should wait until you hear all the news before your level gets to a 10, but you should pay attention. And I think that Aiden Hutchinson's a key player and hopefully he's on the field to start a training camp and everything goes well. I love that. I, I think me and you have the same mindset with that, uh, Doc. I came in very, very emotional and frantic. Like, please, please, please be okay. This is the biggest year ever in Detroit Lions history. But again, it was so long ago. Someone would have reported that. Uh, I do want to ask you though. So we're, we're a week out. You you said you guys, you guys as a me, as media reports in about a week, uh, for training camp. One thing I keep seeing, uh, you know, listeners ask and, and see on the internet all the time, and we actually had the conversation for a little bit uh, the other day on the show, is going into training camp, obviously there are going to be some kind of surprise cuts, and there are going to be players where it's like, hey, there's going to be a microscope on you, you know, like a Levi O and guys like that. What are two guys, and, and I want to go like offense and defense, that you think might get cut from this Lions team just for the people? I know last time you were on, there was a, a mailbag question for you, and I don't think we were able to get to it, so I figured I'd start yep. off with it. Uh, offensively and defensively, who are two players that would be surprising and you would be like, whoa, and that that guy, that gets cut and the, the fans should be a kind of uh, looking out for? Yeah, look, it's uh, uh, the, the toughest part of going out there is now we got to count each player that's there, take attendance each day, and you sometimes got to look deep for the, uh, the players lower on the depth chart. A lot of good competition out there. I think that obviously the one that people are paying attention to is Jake Bates versus Michael Badgley. Uh, Either one that potentially uh, doesn't have an opportunity to win the battle 
might be no uh, not on the team. Maybe Jake Bates, if he shows some things but just nearly falls, maybe ends up on the practice squad. I think uh, the person that kind of early on people are looking to potentially that needs to step up is John Kaminsky. I thought that, uh, you know, he could have had more impact last year. He's a veteran. And maybe potentially if Broderick Martin and Young Cats show some things, maybe he's a candidate. Offensively, that's interesting. That's intriguing. You look at the offense, and there's so many good players, at least the starters, that you can see that there's going to be a real tough battle for the Young Cats to potentially um, to potentially earn a starting spot. So maybe the competition will be between Antoine Green and DPJ. And if one of those two does not uh, stand out clearly, you know, I know that the, the, the lot of talk regarding who's going to be behind Kyle Raymond at wide receiver three and four, I think maybe potentially a surprise cut could be Donovan Peoples-Jones if he doesn't showcase everything that he needs to showcase. I know that the team has always talked publicly that they like him, but at the same token, if he gets beat out by Williams, the undrafted free agent, uh, or if somebody else steps up and Antoine Green steps up, you now have four solid weapons, and then you have the tight ends that are going to be uh, utilized heavily. So I think Donovan Peoples-Jones and John Kaminsky, two guys that got to show a little bit more than they showed. Uh, uh, DPJ didn't show much during uh, DPJ didn't show much during the offseason workouts, and John Kaminsky, obviously a veteran, and wasn't out there all that much. Great having you back on, Doc. And we focus so much on the Lions, especially during training camp. But when you look around the NFC North, do you think there's players from other teams within the NFC North that, one, are going to break out and give the Lions trouble, but also the rest of the NFL? Like, if you look at the Bears, Packers, and Vikings, is there a player on offense or defense where you're like, yeah, I think this guy's going to have a really good year and he's going to give the Lions some trouble? Yeah, um, we uh, at uh, Detroit Lions on SI, the blessing of working with a great network like Sports Illustrated is we get to collaborate with the writers. I've developed good relationships with uh, Bill Huber. He's uh, a spectacular veteran writer of the Packers, and Bill is great. I can bounce ideas off of him, and we all did uh, a lot of roundtables. You can check them out, and we did uh, the all-NFC North team kind of looking at players that will shine, and also as a network collectively, all 32 NFL writers we wrote a story kind of talking about breakout players and the player that uh, Bill chose. And I agree. I have to agree is Jaden Reed. I think that he has a, a special opportunity now with Jordan love another year under their belt to connect and have a strong opportunity to do some things. So I think that Jaden Reed is a special talent. You show, you saw what he was able to do in college and you look at that Packers offense, you know, it's, it's something that has, you know, you look at the coaching staff there, that's the strength of the team. They did some work, in the offseason to revamp that defense led by Rashawn Gary. I, I think the Packers are going to be going toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Lions all season. I think the Lions have more talent across the board. I thought they did enough defensively to kind of give them the edge going into the season, but I'm not going to be surprised if they split the season series. I think Jaden Reed's going to break out. Look for Jordan Love to have more success in LaFleur's system, but I do think that Jaden Reed is a player to watch on the Packers' offense. And, Doc, just kind of going along with it, silent dropped in the chat. Do you think Dontavion Wicks has a chance to really come along? Because I look at him, and I think he's a potential to kind of run Christian Watson out of town if he can't stay healthy. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, you look at the Packers, and they just keep rolling along. You thought they were going to be real bit rebuilding last year. They kind of retooled. And the talk now is going to be what the next step is going to be for Jordan Love, that offense. You look at defensively for them, are they going to be able to uh, – gel as fast as they need to be to take the next step forward. That win that they had in the postseason was spectacular. They were able to do some things, and uh, I think they're poised to take a step further as well to compete at, at, at a high level. I, I love Christian Watson, too. I think that the players that they have on the Packers are well coached, and you realize that continuity there really gives them a, a strong opportunity. And then you realize they retooled the running backs room. So it's going to be a good group, a, a good group. But I still think when you look at it, competitively with the Lions. I think they have more talent across the board on both sides of the football, and they have the best quarterback, I think, with uh, Jared Goff leading everything and all the experience and weapons he's got. That should give them the edge. Uh, John, Brandon Ayuk asked for, officially asked for a trade, and I, I think that significantly impacts the 49ers for a, a big reason being Brock Purdy. I, I thought Ayuk, especially when Debo was out, was so important. Obviously, George Kittle's still there, and they have Christian McCaffrey, who, you know, he's been someone that, plays an entire season he's spectacular but then there'll be times where he misses half a season or misses all of a season I think there's a lot of risk uh, for the 49ers just like there is for a lot of teams they're an injury away but the 49ers not having Ayuk which they don't want to trade him they're probably going to trade him 
What do you? How do you think that impacts the uh, the, the Lions' chances of getting the number one seed? Because I, I think a 49ers regression year, I think, is coming. Uh, maybe not significantly, but John, I think it's coming. Okay, I look at the talent that they have with Debo Samuel. I like Brock Purdy. You always have uh, faith in George Kittle offensively. I think Kyle Shanahan's one of the great offensive minds. It's it's one of those things that when you look at it, you look at it in totality. That's a team that's been consistently knocking at the door. How many more runs are they going to have at it? I thought that you know they they suffered a key injury, obviously in the postseason. They're late. Uh, that's going to be impactful throughout the year. But I look at Brandon Ayuk. It's kind of the playbook that clearly wide receivers use. When they're not happy, they start on following on social media. They start making noise. But I and clearly, you know, we we wrote on Detroit Lions on SI that the Lions don't need uh, the opinion of a lot of the writers. When, when I asked them, they don't need the Lions don't need Brandon Ayuk, especially for a guy that wants a massive contract extension, probably similar to Amon Ross St. Brown. Yeah, he did some damage. Yeah, you saw him do some things against the Lions. But I think that you have the combination of Amon Ross St. Brown and Jamison Williams. I don't think the Lions need Brandon Ayuk. I think that you look at it and you say the combination of tight ends, wide receivers, and running backs, the ball is going to be spread so thin as it is. I think Brandon Ayuk kind of you have already on this roster. So um, I don't think he gets traded. I think they figure it out. Um, maybe, you know, it, it, it's always delicate in regards to how f- we, we don't know exactly how far apart they are in regards to the contracts. And it's tough. You, it's tough in terms of a salary cap leave. You, ha- you have Debo Samuel. Uh, you got Brock Purdy there in waiting. And uh, you look at the situation that, you know, every NFL team faces. You got to make tough choices. And yeah, you know, do you want to end up seeing Brandon Ayuk with the Packers, with the Cowboys? I hope if he does get dealt. It's yet to be seen, but if he does get dealt, I hope it's to an AFC team. And you hope it's basically any team besides the Chiefs. If uh, he ends up with the world champs, look out, because Mahomes can make any uh, any wide receiver look special. But uh, I don't see a regression. I think Lions, I think 49ers, Lions, Eagles, Packers, probably top four teams in the NFC. Yeah. So, so Doc, I want to, I want to throw this out here too. I, I just, my mindset right now is just training camp and, and, and what kind of we're looking forward to in training camp. Um, one thing I think the, the, one of the bigger things of the season, at least for this Lions offense is like, Hey, let's keep this, uh, let, they, they need to keep the offense top five for a third straight year. Um, and I think one of the biggest pieces, obviously you lose Josh Reynolds, but you have a guy named Jameer Gibbs in the backfield now, who's kind of taking a step forward. Um, and people are projecting to be a top five. Uh, running back in the NFL. Um, what are you going to be looking for here at training camp when it comes to um, Ben Johnson and how he's about to use a guy like Jameer Gibbs? And um, I, I think I actually saw you guys put out an article in regards to Jameer Gibbs, and it was a training camp preview um, about how he's going to have to play at different levels um, here on this offense. And do you see him taking like a massive step to where he's just not playing out in the backfield, but he's lined up in the slot, he's lined up out wide, he's lined up at anywhere you can put him, and he's going to see the field a lot more than he did last year. How do you see Ben Johnson using him um, in training camp and going forward? Yeah, no doubt. I think it's always great. First and foremost, early on in training camp, they ease into it. They're not going to be wearing pads the first couple practices. Usually the first three or four are not in pads. So you just get a sense of their conditioning, hopefully get a chance to talk to a lot of the star athletes, young players. That's the early flow of training camp is to get a sense of everybody's offseason, what they worked on, what their goals are, kind of a recap and everything like that. But for Jameer Gibbs, guy's the limit. Every I don't have to be long-winded about Jameer Gibbs. You guys know the talent. You guys know what he's all about. I say you give him a plethora of targets. You include him in a lot of situations. Uh, you hope that he burns from fumbling the football in a key game, and you hope that he comes back strong. But I see MVP candidate in Jameer Gibbs. Uh, for Ben Johnson, uh, clearly I see somebody that, you know, the talk – all throughout the offseason has been now it's 401 level, which means, hey, a lot of these guys have been the fourth year in this system. That means you can do a lot of different things. The route trees can expand. You can have more opportunities for deep plays. Uh, every single player on the offensive roster can get better. Amon Rock can be more of a deep threat. Jamison Williams can be more incorporated. I think early on, I want to see how Jamo's used in practice. How many targets does Jared look to Jamison Williams in some key moments, in those uh, moments – uh, hopefully you guys stayed in the queue long enough to earn some tickets. You'll, you'll fill me in uh, to get out there and see. But I want to see, uh, as training camp progresses, how does Jamison Williams look? And then you got Jameer Gibbs. I think he's a given that he's going to be featured quite a bit. You know, they try to protect running backs a little bit. They don't want to give him too many hits throughout training camp as they want to obviously clearly get him in shape. 
but make sure that he stays healthy. He's going to be a very viable option, but I want to see how he looks coming out of the backfield and how he's incorporated in the offense. But you can clearly see Ben Johnson has a nice weapon and Alvin, Alvin Kamara type really thoroughbred that can do a lot of different things. Get excited. Make sure that you get Jameer Gibbs in the first two, three rounds of your fantasy draft. I think he's going to get a lot in PPR, a lot of touches, a lot of screens, and a lot of opportunities for yards after the catch. Yeah, Doc, keep pushing the Jameer Gibbs MVP narrative. I'm all here for it. As a rookie, he damn near matched Alvin Kamara's career high in rushing yards, so I think he's going to be better than Alvin Kamara. But kind of going back to conversation, I'm going to give you multiple choice questions, Doc. You get you give me your answer how you see best fit. Which of these players do you most likely see getting eight sacks with Detroit Lions? A, Marcus Davenport, B, James Houston, or C, Ali McNeil? Which one of those players do you think is most likely to get eight sacks this year for the Lions? Yeah, no doubt. It's tough. Clearly, one of the things everybody wants to see is Marcus Davenport. We've yet to lay eyes on him on the field. He's been out there in training on the side during the offseason. But uh, I can't say him because he's clearly coming back from injury. So clearly, I think that a guy that's done it before is James Houston. Um, I know that that's a good multiple choice. I think that it's neck and neck with the Lee McNeil. I think he, he'll be in that five to 10 sack category. He's definitely going to blow up with DJ reader next to him, but I think James Houston's got, he's going to come back with a vengeance. He's going to get his clear opportunities to get out there and earn the opportunity to play a little bit more. And I think that he's going to have a real bounce back season. I think that when you're a guy that comes in and bursts onto the scene after Thanksgiving, you have the natural talent. He has the talent that everybody covets, his ability to pressure the quarterback. And if he puts it together in terms of other facets of his game, he can stay out on the field more. But my answer is James Houston because I think he's the problem. He's for real. And if he stays healthy, he'll be able to get to the quarterback a lot more. And when you have DJ Reader and you have Aline McNeil there, that's going to open things up for outside pressure and hopefully – James Houston takes advantage, stays healthy, and gets those sacks. He could have a double-digit sack season this year if he, if he plays wow. all 17 games. Double-digit sacks for the problem. Hey, you know what? Ooh. Yeah, I like that, John. I like that. We talked about it uh, yesterday, and I, I believe it was either Jeff Risen or they talked about it on Detroit Lions podcast that DJ Reader recovery, you know, he's dealing with the torn quad. He might not be ready for the, uh, the start of the season. The thing they were discussing was Broderick Martin potentially seeing snaps early on in the season. Uh, your reaction to that possibility and just your confidence level. In, and I saw him lift. We, we watched the video. He's lifting a trailer with a quad on it. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on Broderick maybe stepping up, having that role until DJ Reader gets healthy? And, and anything you knew about anything you know currently about DJ Reader and his recovery? Yeah, that's what kind of Dan Campbell had said was that he may not be ready for the start of training camp, but he expects – he, from what he said, from what Dan Campbell said, he expects that everybody that was injured, uh, including Davenport and uh, DJ Reader, those that were asked about specifically, that he expected that by training camp, you know, by the conclusion of training camp, he would expect that everybody would be available. But that injury that DJ Reader suffered, look, the Lions are overly cautious. That's how they've been. And that's, that's look, they're looking for DJ Reader to be available when it's crunch time in the postseason. So if he misses it the first game or two, um, that's not going to be that much of an issue because you do, like you said, you do have Broderick Martin and a player that I'm intrigued by, a player to watch is Makai Wingo. I want to see what he's yeah. going to be able to do on the outside. He's also position versatile, can do a lot of different things. And you look at Broderick Martin, he's going to be one of those players that's going to be intriguing when he does get his opportunities. What, what did he learn last year? Uh, how did he acclimate? Did he take to the coaching that the the new the new defensive line coach Terrell Williams is given to him because he did have some fundamental issues in terms of pad level in terms of hand placement and kind of getting out of whack there in terms of you know just consistency these guys all have the talent but they need to be repeatable in practice and showcase it when the opportunity does arise that's why he was inactive for most of the year it was a developmental year now you'll be given more of an opportunity in training camp and more of an opportunity in games, he'll have his opportunities, I think, to showcase what he's about, but he's got to showcase it. And look, you look at his frame, you look at the strength that he put on, he took to the, the recommendation to, to do the work in the off season. And uh, I love the first video. We say, uh, Hey, this guy's looking strong. And everybody's like, I can do that in my backyard. Well then clearly I think that got to the agent. Uh, people were bold enough to message and reply to the video. And they were like, I can do that. I do that every weekend. So then the next video 
is the trailer with the the bike on it. So you're like, okay, look, you can't knock Broderick Martin. He's strong. He's showcased his brute strength, and they really love clearly that he's he's a run stuffer. That's what the Lions are known for along the defensive line. They want to maintain that. So that's job one, but then there's other responsibilities. You have to be consistently uh, able to execute, and I think Broderick Martin will have his opportunity fully to get on the field and play more. Hey, other side of the ball here, Doc, uh, the offensive line. Obviously, the, the situation last year going into the year, um, you, you, you know, you had different – you had Graham Glasgow was kind of that sixth man coming off, and I think it's inevitable that at some point throughout the season, every single year, you, there's going to be an offensive lineman that misses one, two games here and there, and you're never going to have your full five guys out there uh, for 17 games. What, what is your outlook here on, on like a Christian Mahogany or a Colby Sorsdale, the next man up? To me, it feels like after minicamp that uh, they're, they're looking at Colby to go into the, be that kind of sixth man that Graham was last year. Do you think he takes that – I guess, do you think he takes that step and he's ready for it? Because last year he did get thrown into the fire as a tackle uh, just out of nowhere. And, and a lot of people kind of were down on him because of that. But it seems like he came back and he's he's kind of ready to go. Do you see the same thing there? Yeah, I like everything that Colby Sorsdal represents. I think the combination of him, uh, Coyote Awosika, and Mahogany, I think are solid along with Skipper. And then Manu is probably more of the developmental guy that's going to – it's still a little bit raw. But uh, I look at it like you have clearly five great starters that you hope stay healthy throughout the year. But if if not, you look at it, Graham Glasgow is flexible to move over to center. And I think Sorsdahl will be given his opportunity. And I like what he's about. I think that he's he he's put in the work. He's gone to offensive line camps. He's done the necessary things that he needs to do to showcase things. And guys, look, uh, you get a sense when you go out there and you start talking to these guys. It's not like... Um, it's not like college in any certain way. It's like, here's what we're doing. Learn it. And it's true. The phrase that everybody uses is like drinking out of a fire hose. You're just exposed to so much and the train keeps moving. It's not like they sit back and go, okay, we're going to wait for the rookie to pick up everything. No, you got to know the protections. You got to know the offense. You got to know everything that's expected. And at, at the highest level, Jared Goff can shift the protection to any certain thing based on what he sees on defense at the highest level of football. The offensive line needs to be the smartest that, that, that the smartest players on the field, and they need to recognize, pay attention. Communication has to be strong, and there has to be recognition and awareness of exactly where everything needs to be in terms of protections and where you got to be with this offense because plays can change at, at, at a quick whim. Jared Goff can shift the protection, change the play, and everything like that. The, the ben Johnson's offense is is sophisticated at the highest level, so it's clearly a rookie is going to have a tough time adapting to every single thing. And then clearly you guys see defensive linemen uh, across the board, three technique, four or five technique, all the, the edge rushers, outside linebackers. These guys are quicker, faster, stronger. They have all the sophistication of moves. It's, it's tough. Blocking is no easy feat. And that's why when you have players like Panay Sewell and uh, Kevin Zeitler, Frank Ragnow, and Graham Glasgow and Taylor Decker, you appreciate the opportunity that they're going to have to play at a high level. It's no easy feat. And with with the bull rushing defensive linemen that are out there and these versatile uh, defensive linemen that can move around and are shifty, man, it's it's no easy feat. But with the offensive line, I think Colby Sorsdahl, you can trust uh, in a spot role, can at least get some things done. And if he's if he's not, they have a, a other options as well. Yeah, Doc, that, that offensive line for the Lions, without a doubt, is the strength of the team, I think. And I think a lot of people would agree, especially Detroit fans. It's the number one offensive line in the NFL. But the weakness of this Lions team last year is in the secondary. And they addressed part of it by drafting Terrion Arnold. And I think we all have a high expectations for Terrion, especially in his longevity down the road of his career. But early on, what do you think are some things that Terrion could possibly struggle with? He just be coming into the NFL as a rookie at the quarterback yeah. Yeah, no doubt. There's always the, the learning curve, the speed of the game. You guys saw in the, the series receiver how a, a, the expert route running that these guys, the Devontae Adams, the Justin Jefferson, uh, I think the like you said uh, in an earlier question, the, uh, and I had an opportunity to ask the safeties coach at the end of the year, I said, man, I, I kind of think this NFC North has some elite wide receivers, and I think playing on the outside is going to be tough with these uh, the opportunities that these guys have to to put on some moves. He may get beat with a double move once, you know, these guys, you know, it's so tough because uh, playing press man, I, you, you do expect that early on Terry and Arnold is going to excel and, and be physical, but it's tough because you're only allowed certain contact for so many yards. And then these 
Uh, these elite wide receivers know how to find the windows, know how to find avenues to get open, especially with play action, especially with the quarterbacks that are in the NFC North. I think that, you know, you look at Jordan Love, I think he's going to, you know, utilize the receivers well. I know people are not as high on uh, J.J. McCarthy, Sam Darnold, and Caleb Williams, but they'll get better over, over time. But I look at it like, I look at it like this in regards to uh, everything going on. I look at uh, the Detroit Lions as a football team. Uh, I look at the way in which they're constructed. Everything just looks like it's 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 in place with coaching, the experienced coaches that they have. Um, I look at the opportunities that this football team has to take the next step forward in a lot of different avenues. And I think that across the board, this is probably the best version of the Detroit Lions you're going to see. And as long as everybody stays healthy, this football team collectively can do so many things at a very, very high level. Um, for Terry and Arnold, look, you see, you see, uh, if you guys get a chance, he released his latest video, I think two, three days ago, the work that he's putting in, in regards to fundamentally staying with the receivers, you know, uh, the work that he's doing footwork wise is elite at a high level, but cornerbacks, it's just the toughest position. And I keep saying, and I'll keep saying it. I think that friends should not let friends play that position. It's so tough. It's so challenging because the top end speed of these wideouts, you guys saw at the combine, the four, two speed of these receivers, it's sick. And they got these massive wingspans. Uh, I just think the position's tough and he's going to take his lumps. But at the same token, I think that for every time he gets beat, he'll come back stronger and he'll put it, but he'll put it beside him. Um, you know, the, the worst comparison you can make to anybody is Jeff Okuda. I don't see Jeff Okuda in Terry and Arnold. I think we move quickly past that. He'll enter into the, the, the conversation of being one of the better Detroit Lions defensive backs. And I think that you'll see, you'll see him quickly emerge as somebody that works hard and uh, stays true to the craft, but it's just a tough position. And Justin Jefferson, you look at Watson, you look at uh, DJ Moore, you look at Jordan everything Addison, that you yeah, yeah, Allen, Roman if, Jordan, if, if Jordan Addison can put the bottle down, he'll be okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a wild fair. Out. You, you look yeah. at the receivers that are in the NFC North, he's going to have his work cut out for him, I think, but it, uh, it'll make him better quickly. That's what it, I was going to say. I think it's going to benefit him long term because you're just going to, to your quote, Doc. Water's warm, but there's yeah. sharks in the water. And I think those sharks or those elite wide receivers in the NFC North, he's going to struggle early on, but that's going to help him down the road, especially when he starts catching up to the – if he can catch up to those guys' talent and be able to cover them one-on-one, that's going to help him out a lot down the road. Hey, Doc, just with the, the corner stuff, and, and I just – like something that, that I think a lot of people find interesting is they did go out and get some new position coaches um, on the defensive side of the ball, Deshae Townsend and then uh, Terrell Williams or Terrell Williams, however you pronounce his name. But um, you, you kind of – I, I mix it up. I hope I wouldn't get clarification for, for training camp. Is it Terrell? Terrell, yeah. Terrell right. Williams. That's Terrell, Terrell Williams. Terrell Williams. Williams. I, I like that. Terrell, Terrell Williams and, and Deshae Townsend. But they brought those two guys in because obviously the corners needed a ton of work and then the defensive line as well. That was a massive um, – it felt like uh, Dan Campbell looked at that and said, hey, we need to figure something out with this defensive line. What, the, the impact of those guys, you've been around them now through mini camp and, 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 um, and, and through you know the sessions the last couple of weeks. The one for me, though, was Deshae Townsend. What is he like, and is he going to be able to kind of get this? Because I feel like the last few years we've seen corner coaches come in and out of Detroit, and we haven't. Obviously, you haven't had the talent as we have now, but you've seen a lot of different guys now. What do you think uh, Deshae Townsend does here in Detroit? Yeah, look, I don't want to be a, I don't want to be a downer here, but yeah, I thought you know when I watched receiver, I looked at it and I said, man, seeing Cam Sutton just brought back bad memories, yeah. and then you start thinking, man. If the Lions legitimately had cornerbacks last year that were uh, above average and not as disappointing as it was, I think the Lions could have been Super Bowl winners. I think that they tried to gamble with the position, and unfortunately it didn't work out. And then the other aspect of the mistakes when you look at it is going with inexperience with Dre Bly in regards to coaching at the highest level in the NFL. I think Dre Bly was overmatched, and I think that he never got the cornerbacks on the roster to – consistently perform and execute at the highest level. And you look at it, and one thing about uh, Deshae Townsend is he's a former defensive back, and he's got uh, really a, a great working knowledge of the game, got more experience, and I do think that he'll bring the knowledge base along with Coach uh, Terrell Williams. Uh, I, I, Terrell Williams. I think that Terrell Williams, really, uh, Terrell Williams is real intriguing when you see his talk. He's like, oh, you guys are talking about me as being a big teddy bear and everybody loves me. Wait till training camp when I get on these guys for not executing when the pads come on. He's like, 
that's going to change. Don't equate me with being a teddy bear. Um, and Deshae Townsend, I think, will get the most out. I think, too, when you look at uh, – you, you need a certain skill set to be a developmental coach, to be a position coach. You need to be able to relay the message – uh, of the defensive coordinator and be able to develop the talent. And that's going to be key because you have a couple of young defensive backs. And I think Coach Townsend is the perfect fit for what the Lions are looking to do, especially with Ennis Rakestraw and uh, Tyrion Arnold. And then you got two veterans in Amik Robertson and Carlton Davis who are also looking to improve. So I think that Coach Townsend is a great addition along with Coach Williams. I think that they <laughs> drastically upgraded from what they had. Coach Scott – Kind of was hinted at, maybe wasn't as, um, you know, in regards to getting the most out of the of the defensive line last year. And unfortunately, the jump from college to the pros is totally different. Yep. So it just wasn't a fit. And the Lions quickly. The one thing about Coach Dan Campbell, if there's if it's not the right fit, you're not going to stay long in Detroit, player or coach. Uh, Doc, we, we had this conversation the other day. Uh, we, we came out with our own top 10 head coaches in the NFL. We wanted to see where Dan Campbell ranked. I had Jim Harbaugh, uh, a little higher than Dan. The guy, the guys had him behind Dan. I, I want to know where you're at with Dan Campbell. Where does he rank in your top 10? Do you think he's someone that solidified himself as a top 10 coach? I think Booner had him five. Um, uh, wh where's the highest you'd, you'd probably rank Dan and when, what do you think he's gotten to at this point? Yeah, no doubt. I think that you guys, uh, I heard me say it. I said it on your show. I think he can be the next Andy Reid. I think he's definitely in the top five. Um, I believe that when you look at a coach of Dan Campbell's caliber, you, you see that, you know, it's going to be about in-game coaching and making sure that, you know, he makes the key decisions at the right time in terms of balancing aggressiveness. You look at the coaches in the NFL, there really is only a handful that you can say, hey, consistently make decent choices and put their teams in positions to win. And you clearly see it in Andy Reid, John Harbaugh, always up there. Um, I look at uh, a lot of the coaches in the AFC, and, and you, you realize, okay, there's a lot of good coaches out there now that are gaining experience. Uh, Coach Taylor with the Bengals. And then you got Dan Campbell right in the mix. Uh, you recognize, look, you know, I'm curious to see how Coach Harbaugh does with the Chargers uh, now that he's had some time away. Does he still – to me, he kind of has that personality that probably, to me, is better suited for college, but he did have NFL success. Let's see how long and, and, and let's see, does he re replicate the success that he had with the, with the 49ers? Um, but Dan Campbell right in the mix. I think he's, you know, a solid candidate for a coach of the year. I think that everything that you'd want in an NFL coach, Dan Campbell has in terms of play calling abilities, uh, solid insight, relatability to the players, a feel for the game and somebody that in the end, when you stand up in front of a group of men and you speak and you got people that want to run through a wall for you, it, it goes on, uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's definitely a, a factor that not a lot of coaches can get. Yeah, a lot of coaches try to say it, but you look at it and you say not a lot can reach these uh, high ego, high price players and get them to buy in, become a family truly and fight for you. And uh, Dan Campbell earned the respect of the players because he's honest, he's real, he's relatable. And everybody now, when you talk about coaching in Detroit, as opposed to the you know, disappointment and disaster that was Matt Patricia. Everybody that talks about Dan Campbell across the league says, hey, I want to play for that guy because he's real and he'll give me the best chance to succeed and he'll keep it honest and real with me. And uh, he's real no matter what. In good times and bad times, you get the same guy. And, uh, man, you, you just can't say a lot of – you can't say enough great things about Dan Campbell. And you just hope that with everybody else, he also gets better – this year in year four, sky's the limit for Dan Campbell. I think that if he gets it, gets that Super Bowl, he could be looking at the next uh, Bill Belichick in regards to length of time in Detroit. He, he wins the Super Bowl. You give him, <laughs> I think nobody would mind. Yeah, if, life, if, lifetime. Lifetime contract would be probably I'm written in. by somebody. Maybe I'm me. All in. all in. Build build that statue and get that contract <laughs> written. Lifetime, well, baby. The people are coming in with some questions. We'll start with Dad with Tourette's. He says, how confident are you or mu what must you see to be confident in the backup offensive lineman? Injuries are relatively random, but someone from the O-line is likely to finally get that injury and miss games. Yeah, uh, we talked about that uh, clearly with Colby Sorsdahl. I'm confident. It's deep. Look, also another coach that's unheralded and needs more respect is Hank Fraley. That man is grinding, putting uh, in the work. No I question. That, no question that there's opportunities for guys – if injuries pop up, but I'm confident that uh, they have enough to get things done. If, if should there be an injury, and uh, uh, hopefully, you know, if you do 
truly have Tourette's, hopefully you're managing it in the best way possible. I have a couple of clients with it. It's uh, unique. And uh, some of my favorite opportunities are to talk to, to people with Tourette's and how they kind of see the world and how they have to kind of dodge and weave certain uh, social situations. So my best wishes to you, dad with Tourette's. Uh, I, I see a lot of things, you know, people talk about the backup offensive linemen. It, every team struggles with depth. Like, I don't know, name me a team that has a full unit ready to go after their starters. You know, like that's, that's where I, I am with the offensive line. Like I'm, I'm confident, but when you have the best, like Lucas said earlier, you're the best offensive line. Like you're still gonna, you know, you're still gonna be a little worried. Mark has asked question. Can the Detroit Lions and Jared Goff get to the Super Bowl? Uh, mm -hmm. well, I mean, I, I think, you know, that answer, John, I think you know, yeah, that absolutely. No doubt about it. Bank on it. I think that when you got the Super Bowl in new Orleans, if they can stay healthy and peak uh -huh. at the right time, you got JMO, you got a couple emerging stars potentially on defense too coming through. If the additions that they brought come through Davenport reader, Carlton Davis, Amik Robertson, you look at it and you say, why not the Detroit Lions? You have to envision it. I'm envisioning it. I think about it every day. I want to be there to cover a Super Bowl winning team because uh, I was there in the shitty times. I followed a football team that went uh, a whole season, didn't win. You got to be, it's horrible. It's, it's, it got funny at times, but you know, when you're uh, a football fan and you watch a team go through a whole year and not win a single game. It's long, it's devastating. And then to repair all that, I was a season ticket holder and now the opportunity to work in media, to be as close as I am to that football team, I think it would come full circle if uh, the opportunity presented itself for that football team to win. It would be great for the city. It would be one of the best sports stories of all time. The Detroit Lions win the Super Bowl. I picture it, I, I say it out loud. Oh, I, I get excited when I go for walks. I get excited when I hop on interviews potentially one day after the Super Bowl to talk about what the hell just happened when the Lions won the Super Bowl. And, and uh, Jeff, Jeff, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this question. I don't want to cut you off. The, the kick return question. I, I want to throw that out the guy, the guy up north. Doc, we talked about it about a month ago before minicamp, and I, I brought up the, the, the conversation on our show here, and we got in the, a little debate that I felt like J Jamison Williams, Jameer, like these guys like Jamison Williams will be in that position for kick returns. Now that you saw mini camp, I know there's certain things you can't say or can say. What are your kind of thoughts here with the with, with the kick return over the last month? Has your mindset changed, or where do you stand on it? Are we going to see some kick returns for touchdowns this year with the new? Why the new not? I would love format? to see some skill offensive players. I think that the new kickoff rule is going to be unique. It's going to be special. So I'm going to say if you throw out a number, how many total kickoff return touchdowns? You know, I'm a big fan of number four. So four kick return touchdowns and let's maybe I'm way under, but uh, let's see how early on it shakes out across the league. But I think that there's more opportunities for guys to get to, um, to get open and uh, have an opportunity. The one question, someone asked a great mailbag question. What's going to happen if Ben Johnson leaves guys, I'm going to tease it tomorrow. If the communication that I had with Christian was accurate. And I remember what I told him to write, we have an outside the box candidate that I think is uh -oh. perfect. Outside the box, not being talked about, not on the roster, not a current coach that is somebody that has experience working with legendary quarterbacks that I think is a better play caller than the position that he's in. And so I think that there's an opportunity, and I'll tease it, Dan Campbell has told stories about this man. I think there's a connection that could be worked. And based on my television viewing habits, I think potentially – he could go to somebody that he knows from his olden days that could potentially run this offense pretty smoothly. So pay attention to Detroit Lions on SI as we uh, as my ideas filter through the writers. Does he does he happen to be a former? Um, I shouldn't say former. Did he run another quarterback out of town this off season? Did he run? Uh, uh, no, no, okay. uh, no. This is a coach that is. Um, Somebody that is currently, let's just say, on the hot seat and somebody that uh, has had a unique pass with Dan Campbell. Do you know who I'm bringing in? If Say we can't take Tanner Angstrand. You know who I'm going to bring in? Who are you bringing in? Go get me that man over at ESPN. Bring me Dan Orlovsky. Oh Let my that God. man come oh. in and call the players. <laughs>
<laughs> no, I'm just, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Dude, I thought listen, that was... He's smart. I think he needs to start the trajectory of quarterbacks coach first yeah. before play caller. I, the I, offensive that'd be a funny one. Elite. That would be a funny one if he did that. Oh, but I, don't, I, don't, I just saw I, one in the chat. I, I think, think I might have. We yeah. got it. I, I, we got, well, you got to check out Detroit Lions on SI. Detroit Lions S. Uh, Detroit Lions on SI for the for the creative. All the article topics come from me. Listen, I'm not going to talk about myself too much, but my writers <laughs> are in tune with my vision, and they can execute everything that I want to write about. And we have outside the box ideas, and we we're open to talk about a lot of different things. And uh, it's a great now unified family with Sports Illustrated. All the site names are called uh, their site names on SI. We can finally say Sports Illustrated. We're not embargoed to say the SI, <laughs> that we're part of the family, uh, a big part of the family. Uh, had meetings earlier today. Things are going swell. Thank you guys again for reading us during the off seasons. Typically supposed to be slow. We're putting out content. You guys are listening to it, following it, watching the videos like crazy, and then talking about it on various platforms. My like, I'm deeply humbled, and uh, I haven't been in the past, but I'm deeply humbled to be part of the media. I always look back and say that, oh my God, I was a fan that was sitting in the stands as a season ticket holder crying that they would lose and getting pissed off to now cover the team to be able to have information and be and and seeing that you know 10,000 people waiting for a queue for training camp tickets it's going to be it's going to be special. Did you guys get in? Did you get in the queue? Am I going to get a chance to say hello at you, to oh, you guys? Oh yeah, we, we Booner held it down, Doc. I got Booner. tickets. I've got I've got quite a bit. We're going to we're going to we're not going to do a giveaway because we feel like people should be able to just get tickets and go, but we're going to give like, if there are listeners, we have extra tickets yep. as well. Listeners, um, We're, we're going to, if people come out and say, Hey, we need, we need this day, this day, I have some extra tickets we're going to give out, but we do have four of the six days crunch time. Whole crew will be there. I've got tickets for four, four. Actually, I've got tickets for six of the days, but four of them, we're all going to be there. So Absolutely. Be- Boner. Damn, man. Look at you hogging up all the tickets for all those poor fans that were crying online. They couldn't get in. <laughs> got them. Oh, my God. No, I, Damn right. Damn so what happened oh, was, God, it's a monopoly. It's no, monopoly. What, what happened was we, we needed a certain amount and you're only allowed to get up to a certain amount. So I went in and said, I'm going to get these days. And, and I ended up getting extras that we don't need. But again, we're, we're not going to put any. Hey, you have to retweet for a chance to win. We're just going to give yeah. them away to people. I, I figured that was probably the best path because it did run out. I kind of felt bad. I had some extras and I was like, people didn't get it. I was like, oh, no. Yeah. Got well, it. Well, well, right all right. I, I, before I get out of here, I do got just two things for you guys. Uh, Tarek Skubal, if Baltimore gives up their number one prospect, do you trade Tarek Skubal? Is it, is it, if, if they give up the package that everyone's talking about, Sports Illustrated did talk and get sources saying, hey, they're loading up for a package. You doing it if they offer the one and, and some more. Are you willing now to let go if the one is included? I've got the my answer. One. Yes. No. Come no. on, man. They're, I get it. Up. I get it. But th- this th- when you keep taking these packages, and, and this is just my, my point of view. I feel like everyone's been like half and half on this. My side of the and point of view is you've been waiting. You've been loading up on different uh, prospects for years now and collecting your own and, and drafting your own. I think you're at a point now, you're seven games back at the wild card. I'm not saying they're going to make a wild card, but you have two pitchers in your organization now who are legit dudes in the in the major leagues. And if you can build around those two guys and you can go out this offseason and bring in some actual free agents outside of guys like Kenta Maeda and go out there and actually go get some guys who will make an impact and go buy some bats in the offseason, and you have Scooble and Flaherty, you have a legit baseball team next year. Now, if you trade away Scooble and Flaherty and you just, you just keep stacking up, like you're going to be the same spot you were last or next year and it's going to take two or three more years um so I, i'm at the point to where it's like there's a there's a, a time where you cut it off you have if not the best pitcher in the in the major leagues right now and you have flaherty who's up there as well and you're at the point to where it's say hey we can hold we can keep guys we can extend guys and we can wait we have an, they have enough the tigers have enough guys in the, in the funnel to be able to say hey we can bring guys in and pay for bats now and then we have our own prospects coming up too so like we're we're right there now day's uh, coming up yeah okay. so that's where i'm at with the doc i i, I get there's i get too if like you want to move on from them, i get it i just think there's like a point and it's the same thing in every sport there's a point where it's like enough is enough we have our guys cut it off and let's 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 ride now okay and then one last right. thing one last one last thing uh, 
everyone went crazy with Jalen Brown talking smack about Bronny James. Listen, guys, I wasn't lip reading. I saw the two ladies he was with. I was like, I didn't pay attention one to one second of Jalen Brown. My goodness. Angel Reese. I, 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 you know what? I have to change my tune. I was team Caitlin Clark. I changed my mind. I'm all about Angel Reese. I think that her one photo in you that, the, uh, you, you, and, and then her walking around the summer big league. Big personality. Big yeah. personality. I think she's got the assets that are needed to succeed in life. And I'm a big fan <laughs> of Angel Reese. I think the WNBA is going to shine, not because of Clark, because of Angel Reese. I'm team Reese. I changed, I changed affiliation. Hey, you know what? I mean, I, mean I, 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 I flipped. Hey, I, <laughs> <laughs> he said I flipped. I uh, flipped. You know what, Doc? Yeah, I, bet, I, I respect it. I, we, you I know what? You flipped all right, Doc. You know what? I don't hate it. <laughs> hey, Doc, uh, we appre- by the way, Jalen Brown, relax. All right? Relax. Guys, not a pro, baby. Around. Not a pro. Hey, hey, that's he said it. It went crazy. But uh, yeah, I was like, oh, damn. I didn't even check out what the hell he was saying. I was like, Angel yeah. and his girl are like, you might have had a good night there. In and Vegas. Had, yeah. Alex, <laughs> my guy, Alex Sar 0 for 15 in a summer league game. I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't. Crazy. Uh, crazy. But I can't believe John shows up every single Wednesday and absolutely crushes it. John. And by yeah. the way, Detroit Lions on Sports Illustrated. Go check it out. Link is in the description. I mean, I use a lot of it for our, our topics here, John. So thank you for content. Uh, but more than that, thank you for, for appearing every single Wednesday. Uh, we'll catch you next Wednesday, John. And it'll be fun. We'll catch you at training camp. It'll be a blast. Peace, Doc. Per sources, Lions, baby, Super Bowl. Oh, the path, baby. <laughs> per sources. There you go. John Macro, the doc, joining us on a Wednesday, joins every single Wednesday. So Shut please, up. for all the new viewers, every Wednesday, the Mac, the, the doc, Mr. Macaroon will be here.